Chapter Fifteen, The Man of the Island. From the side of the hill, which was here steep and stony, a spout of gravel was dislodged and fell rattling and bounding through the trees. My eyes turned instinctively in that direction, and I saw a figure leap with great rapidity behind the trunk of a pine. What it was, whether bear or man or monkey, I could in no wise tell. It seemed dark and shaggy; more I knew not. But the terror of this new apparition brought me to a stand. I was now, it seemed, cut off upon both sides. Behind me, the murderers. Before me, this lurking nondescript. And immediately, I began to prefer the dangers that I knew to those I knew not. Silver himself appeared less terrible in contrast with this creature of the woods. And I turned on my heel and, looking sharply behind me over my shoulder, began to retrace my steps in the direction of the boats. Instantly, the figure reappeared and, making a wide circuit, began to head me off. I was tired, at any rate. But had I been as fresh as when I rose, I could see it was in vain for me to contend in speed with such an adversary. From trunk to trunk, the creature flitted like a deer, running man-like on two legs, but unlike any man that I had ever seen, stooping almost double as it ran. Yet a man it was. I could no longer be in doubt about that. I began to recall what I had heard of cannibals. I was with an ace of calling for help, but the mere fact that he was a man, however wild, had somewhat reassured me. And my fear of silver began to revive in proportion. I stood still, therefore, and cast about for some method of escape. And as I was so thinking, the recollection of my pistol flashed into my mind. As soon as I remembered I was not defenceless, courage glowed again in my heart, and I set my face resolutely for this man of the island and walked briskly toward him. He was concealed by this time behind another tree trunk. But he must have been watching me closely, for as soon as I began to move in his direction, he reappeared and took a step to meet me. Then he hesitated, drew back, came forward again, and at last, to my wonder and confusion, threw himself on his knees and held out his clasped hands in supplication. At that, I once more stopped. "Who are you?" I asked. "Ben Gunn," he answered. And his voice sounded hoarse and awkward, like a rusty lock. I'm poor Ben Gunn, I am, and I haven't spoke with a Christian these three years. I could now see that he was a white man like myself, and that his features were even pleasing. His skin, wherever it was exposed, was burned by the sun. Even his lips were black, and his fair eyes looked quite startling in so dark a face. Of all the beggar men that I had seen or fancied, he was the chief for raggedness. He was clothed with tatters of old ship's canvas and old sea cloth, and this extraordinary patchwork was all held together by a system of the most various and incongruous fastenings: brass buttons, bits of stick, and loops of tarry gaskin. About his waist, he wore an old brass buckled leather belt. Which was the one thing solid in his old accoutrement. Three years, I cried. Were you shipwrecked? Nay, mate, said he. Marooned. I had heard that word, and I knew it stood for a horrible kind of punishment, common enough among the buccaneers, in which the offender is put ashore with a little powder and shot, and left behind on some desolate and distant island. Marooned three years agone, he continued, and lived on goats since then, and berries and oysters. Wherever a man is, says I, a man can do for himself. But mate, my heart is sore for Christian diet. You mayn't happen to have a piece of cheese about you now. No, well, many's the long night I've dreamed of cheese, toasted mostly, and woke up again, and here I were. If ever I can get aboard again," said I, "you shall have cheese by the stone." 
At this time he had been feeling the stuff of my jacket, smoothing my hands, looking at my boots, and generally in the intervals of his speech showing a childish pleasure in the presence of a fellow creature. But at my last words he perked up into a kind of startled slyness. If ever you get aboard again, says you, he repeated. Why now, who's to hinder you? Not you, I know, was my reply. Oh, and right you was, he cried. Now you, what do you call yourself, mate? Jim, I told him. Jim, Jim, says he, quite pleased apparently. Well now, Jim, I've lived that rough as you'd be ashamed to hear of. Now, for instance, you wouldn't think I had had a pious mother to look at me, he asked. Why, uh, no, not in particular, I answered. Ah, well, said he, but I had remarkably pious, and I was a civil pious boy, and could rattle off my catechism that fast you couldn't tell one word from another. And here's what it come to, Jim, and it begun with Chuck Farthen on the blessed gravestones. That's what it begun with. And it went farther than that, and so my mother told me and predicted the whole she did, the pious woman. But it were a providence that put me here. I've thought it all out in this here lonely island, and I'm back on piety. You can't catch me tasting rum so much, but just a thimbleful for luck, of course, the first chance I have. I'm bound I'll be good, and I see the way to. And Jim, looking all round him and lowering his voice to a whisper, I'm rich. I now felt sure that the poor fellow had gone crazy in his solitude, and I suppose I must have shown the feeling in my face, for he repeated the statement hotly. Rich, rich, I says, and I'll tell you what, I'll make a man of you, Jim. Ah, oh, Jim, you'll bless your stars, you will. You was the first that found me. And at this there came suddenly a lowering shadow over his face, and he tightened his grasp upon my hand, and raised a forefinger threateningly before my eyes. Now, Jim, you tell me true. That ain't Flint's ship? he asked. At this I had a happy inspiration. I began to believe that I had found an ally, and I answered him at once. It's not Flint's ship, and Flint is dead. But I'll tell you true, but I'll tell you true, as you ask me. There are some of Flint's hands aboard. Worst luck for the rest of us. Not a man with one leg, he gasped. Silver, I asked. Ah, oh, Silver, says he. That were his name. He's the cook, and the ringleader, too. He was still holding me by the wrist, and at that he gave it quite a ring. If you was sent by Long John, he said, I'm as good as pork, and I know it. But where was you, do you suppose? I had made up my mind in a moment, and by way of answer told him the whole story of our voyage, and the predicament in which we found ourselves. He heard me with the keenest interest, and when I had done he patted me on the head. You're a good lad, Jim, he said, and you're all in a clove hitch, ain't you? Well, you just put your trust in Ben Gunn. Ben Gunn's the man to do it. Would you think it likely now that your squire would prove a liberal-minded one in case of help, him being in a clove hitch, as you remark? I told him the squire was the most liberal of men. Ah, but you see, returned Ben Gunn, I didn't mean giving me a gate to keep, but a suit of livery clothes and such. That's not my mark, Jim. What I mean is, would he be likely to come down to the tune of, say, one thousand pounds out of money that's as good as a man's own already? I'm sure he would said I. As it is, all hands were to share. And a passage home, he added, with a look of great shrewdness. Why, I cried, the squire's a gentleman, and besides, 
If we got rid of the others, we should want you to help work the vessel home. Oh, said he, so you would. And he seemed very much relieved. Now, I'll tell you what, he went on. So much I'll tell you and no more. I were in Flint's ship when he buried the treasure. He and six along, six strong seamen. They was ashore nigh on a week, and us standing off and on in the old walrus. One fine day up went the signal, and here come Flint by himself in a little boat, and his head done up in a blue scarf. The sun was getting up, and mortal white he looked about the cut water. But there he was, you mind, and the six all dead, dead and buried. How had he done it? Not a man of Baldus could make out. It was battle, murder, and sudden death, leastways, him against six. Billy Bones was the mate. Long John he was quartermaster and they asked him where the treasure was. Ah, he says, you can go ashore if you like and stay, he says, but as for the ship, she'll be up for more by thunder. That's what he said. Well, I was in another ship three years back, and we sighted this island. Boys, said I, here's Flint's treasure. Let's land and find it. The captain was displeased at that, but my messmates were all of a mind and landed. Twelve days they looked for it, and every day they had the worst word for me, until one fine morning... All hands went aboard. As for you, Benjamin Gunn, says they, here's a musket, they says, and a spade and a pickaxe. You can stay here and find Flint's money for yourself, they says. Well, Jim, three years have I been here and not a bite of Christian diet from that day to this. But now you look here, look at me, do I look like a man before the mast? No, says you, nor I weren't neither, I says. And with that he winked and pinched me hard. Just you mention them words to your squire, Jim, he went on. Nor he weren't neither, that's the words. Three years he were the man of this island, light and dark, fair and rain, and sometimes he would, maybe, think upon a prayer, says you, and sometimes he would, maybe, think of his old mother. So be as she's alive, you'll say. But the most part of Gunn's time, this is what you'll say, the most part of his time was took up with another matter. And then you'll give him a nip, like I do. And he pinched me again, in the most confidential manner. Then, he continued, then you'll up and you'll say this. Gun is a good man, you'll say. And he puts a precious sight more confidence, a precious sight, mind that, in a gentleman born than in these gentlemen of fortune, having been one himself. Well, I said, I don't understand one word that you've been saying, but that's neither here nor there, for how am I to get on board? Ah, said he, that's the hitch for sure. Well, there's my boat that I made with my two hands. I keep her under the white rock. If the worst come to the worst, we might try that after dark. Hi, hey, he broke out, what's that? For just then, although the sun had still an hour or two to run, all the echoes of the island awoke, and bellowed to the thunder of a cannon. "'They have begun to fight!' I cried. "'Follow me!' And I began to run toward the anchorage, my terrors all forgotten, while close at my side the marooned man in his goatskins trotted easily and lightly. "'Left, left!' says he. Keep to your left hand, mate, Jim, under the trees with you. That's where I killed my first goat. 
They don't come down here now. They're all mast-headed on their mountains for the fear of Benjamin Gunn. Ah, and there's the cemetery. Cemetery, he must have meant. You see the mounds? I come here and prayed nows and thens, when I thought maybe a Sunday would be about do. It weren't quite a chapel, but it seemed more solemn-like, and then, says you, Ben Gunn was short-handed. No chaplain, or so much as a Bible and a flag, says you. So he kept talking as I ran, neither expecting nor receiving any answer. The cannon shot was followed after a considerable interval by a volley of small arms. Another pause, and then, not a quarter of a mile in front of me, I beheld the Union Jack flutter in the air above a wood. End of chapter 15 Part 4 The Stockade <laughs>